tribute to the noble lady Baroness Helich for her work in the Western Balkans and particularly on sexual violence. She brings an immense wealth of knowledge to this debate, not least from her own personal story of courage. But I would also agree with her that the absence of the noble lord, Lord Ashdown, from this debate is strongly felt. And I know he and the noble Baroness shared a great deal of admiration for one another. It is undeniable that the Western Balkans have come a long way since the 1990s, when the region was subject to some of the worst violence of the late 20th century. In the past 10 years, overall prosperity in the region has begun to improve, and peace in the region has enabled many to begin rebuilding their lives and livelihoods. We know unequivocally that safety and security are the foundations of creating prosperity for people and nations. And there is a great deal of potential for the region to continue to build on this foundation. But peace has not brought the deep reconciliation and stability required for the nation and region to actually flourish. The absence of violence has not meant that the region is without significant challenges. It is still blighted by deep-running economic, political and social issues. And despite progress, the Western Balkans still rank the lowest of the European nations on the Legatum Prosperity Index, of which I declare an interest. As we have heard, the region remains trapped by chronic economic stagnation and the subsequent social challenges that follow. Bilateral disputes such as the independence dispute between Serbia and Kosovo, ethnic tensions and political issues that mean progress cannot be taken for granted. Economically, the Western Balkans are seeing growth across the region at around 3.5% per year. But this growth is fragile as the region lacks the foundation for sustainable long-term economic growth. And generally, across Eastern Europe, productivity is rising, but the Western Balkans are lagging behind the rest of the region. Albania's output per worker between 2010 and 2018 is almost half that of Croatia and Hungary, and economic complexity, levels of entrepreneurship, and venture capital investment are all low compared with the rest of the region. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia and Serbia have all seen their exports grow, but growing consumption and large infrastructure projects have led to more goods being imported and stagnating growth. This has inevitable consequences, as we have heard, with unemployment remaining staggeringly high across the region, particularly in Macedonia, where unemployment is almost at 25%. But youth unemployment is of particular concern, with rates ranging from 30% in Montenegro to 50% in Macedonia and over 54% in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the second highest youth unemployment rate in the world. We know the despair and hopelessness that this lack of purpose and opportunity brings as young people face day after day of rejection from employers. This in turn is driving significant economic migration across the region as people seek opportunity elsewhere. A net migration away from Albania between 2000 and 2015 stood at almost 16% of the population. This is not just a problem affecting the young. Across the region, people are losing faith in their national economies to provide the opportunities that will allow them to flourish. 43% of Western Balkan citizens have considered emigrating elsewhere. This will have long-term implications for strengthening their economies as talented people disappear elsewhere. Without the deep work of reconciliation and under the pressure of stagnating economies, ethnic tensions remain high and society is divided throughout the region despite the passage of time since active conflict. Although officially boundaries between communities no longer exist in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the reality is a society divided by norms which have not changed over time. True reconciliation between communities has not taken root, added to which an estimated 220 to 330 Bosnian foreign fighters travelled to conflict zones 
in Iraq and Syria. When you consider that almost two-thirds of all armed conflicts that ended in the early 2000s had relapsed within five years, it shows the fragility of peace unless long-term reconciliation is built and achieved. Why does this concern us in the UK, though, when we are a nation that some would argue are geographically far away from the Western Balkans? If the economic, social and political instability do not motivate us to support this region of the world, then maybe the overflow onto our own streets might be enough to move us to remain committed to acting in this region. The Western Balkans all score very poorly on the World Bank rule of law indicators and trust in judicial independence is poor. Coupled with weak governance in general, this has created the space for organised crime, including, as we've heard, drugs and human trafficking, to thrive. Committing to a stable Western Balkans is vital for the security of Europe as a whole, but it's also key to ensuring that the results of organised crime and radicalisation do not end up on our streets here. I therefore want to congratulate the government on their commitment to having almost doubled the funding for the region to 80 million in 2020-2021 through the Conflict Stability and Security Fund. In addition to this, the work that we are doing to strengthen the rule of law and justice sectors is a step in the right direction. But I would like to add my question to the same questions as many noble ministers have asked in terms of commenting on the government's plan to continue our commitment to this um, region of the world as we leave the European Union. This is an important demonstration of the UK as global Britain and the outworking of our future partnership in Europe, both in and beyond the European Union. My Lord, I too.